now. Well, good morning and welcome to module three of organic agronomy training with Dr. Martin Entz from the University of Manitoba. Um, it's been a great uh, first few sessions and uh, I know today uh, will be uh, as, as good as the rest have been. So I'm just gonna quickly go through uh, just an opening presentation. Uh, starting starting with some housekeeping uh, so that you get the best out of your session today. Oh, and my name is Marla Carlson. Um, I'm the coordinator for the Canadian Organic Ingredient Strategy, uh, which is uh, being funded by uh, the federal government and uh, being run by the Prairie Organic Development uh, Fund. Back to the housekeeping. So um, just so you get the best out of today, if you could close down any unnecessary programs that you might have running in the background, that'll help improve your quality, both audio and video. Um, we are taking questions in the chat function uh, as, as we have in the first two sessions as well. Uh, Martin will leave some time at the end to uh, answer uh, maybe one or two questions, but uh, the purpose of these webinars is to um, share as much content as we can. And on the 13th of January, uh, Martin will uh, have a whole session on the questions and answers. So um, that uh, make sure you're signed up for that and tune in for that. Um, all training sessions are being recorded and posted on the Pivot and Grow uh, YouTube channel. Um, and finally, bear with us, there are some technical glitches as we go along, and some of you have, may have found that yesterday when you received an email uh, about the course content uh, saying that a link was broken. Um, just so you know, everything is posted on using the same link throughout, so uh, even if that link is broken, you still have access to it just by uh, clicking on a, a link that you've received previously, so you're not, you're not missing out. Just a little bit about the Prairie Organic Development Fund. Uh, we're an investment platform established to uh, grow and develop the organic sector across the Canadian prairies. And of course, uh, like all nonprofits, we can't do it without our sponsors. So we're very, very grateful uh, to uh, the our platinum sponsors, Grain Millers and the Southwood Development Commission, our silver sponsors, Nature's Path, the Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security, uh, PHS Organics and uh, FW Cobbs. And uh, the base of our funding uh, has come through the Canadian uh, Agricultural Partnership, uh, which is a federal government funding program. And without further ado, why we're all here today uh, to hear from Dr. Martin Entz today. So I'm going to pass over to you, Martin, uh, and yeah, take it away. Okay, um, just to let you know, it says I can't share my screen, so maybe That's, I'll have to do a, a keystroke. Yeah. Good, good no. morning, everyone. There you uh, go. You can have a now try, Martin. Okay, Sorry to interrupt there we go. You. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So good morning, everyone. Um, I can't believe people are still interested in hearing from me. This is really nice. Um, uh, so um, I hope you all had a good weekend and you're uh, doing well with your work. Um, I'm going to uh, focus on insect and diseases today, and I know it says weeds. Uh, I did some weed control work last week, uh, and I'm going to link some of the weed control stuff in with the soil health uh, module, which is Thursday morning. And I just want to remind you that please send all your questions, and I'm going to answer each of them. There's going to be a Word document with every one of your questions is going to have an answer, and then we'll have a discussion on Friday the 13th. Okay. So let me get going. Good morning. Uh, so while we have a lot of scientists working in Canada and around the world on insect and plant disease issues, uh, unfortunately, not a lot of their talent has been dedicated to organic production. And that I'm just it's a bit of a disclaimer. It does leave us with some knowledge gaps. However, uh, we do know a lot of things, and uh, um, I want to share some of those. So. In terms of insects, the vast majority of insect really don't insects don't cause any noticeable problems in our farming systems, in our organic farming systems. The second rule of thumb is, is pest problems are less likely in a complex farm ecosystem. That means where we have more diversity of structure. And so one of those examples is intercropping and cover cropping. This definitely can help reduce insect problems. Um, 
we're now thinking about cultivating the farm for beneficial insects. I think there's a lot of exciting things there. We don't know that many things about it. We do know some things. I want to share those. And then I want to spend a little bit of time on grasshoppers because this is a cyclical insect, which can be devastating, as you probably well know. So let's get right into it. So the picture in front of you is actually uh, two farms. The farm on the left is an organic farm, and it's within the white lines. This is about a 1,800-acre organic farm in western Manitoba. And on the right is a conventional farm. And the landscape features are very different. Part of that is because the organic farm has inherently different landscape features, but a big part of it is that the farmer has managed to keep the diversity on the farm. So if we asked, you know, insect scientists, entomologists, uh, what would they expect uh, in terms of the insect issues on the farm, the farm on the left versus the farm on the right? And one such entomologist is Larry Phelan, who has had a, a, an amazing contribution at <clears throat> Ohio State University. And I'll just share a little bit of the data that he has collected. And uh, one of the studies, they took soil from an organic, some organic farms and some conventional farms, brought them into the greenhouse, <clears throat> and then tried to measure the egg laying preferences for the European uh, corn borers uh, in those different soils. And the work has uh, been published over 10 years ago now. And what they found is if you look uh, at this graph on the left, the number of eggs per plant that were laid was um, significantly lower in the soils managed organically versus the soil managed conventionally. That was surprising. And in fact, in the publication, they talked about how exciting and surprising that was. And the other thing they noticed is the variation, uh, the population variance of egg laying by that insect pest of corn was much higher in the conventional versus the organic, which means that the ability of the organic soil in this case to uh, make it unattractive for the female to lay eggs uh, was more consistent than in the conventional system. Now, similar work, if this was a one-off, you know, I, I wouldn't share this with you. I think it would be too naive and risky to um, get people excited about this, but this is not the first time this has been observed. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Lundgren, who operates um, out of Blue Dasher Farms in South Dakota, has done similar work, and I've had the chance to work with Jonathan and uh, review his his research or look at his research, and he's found very similar results. And uh, one of the other things that Jonathan has found is that soil organic matter has a strong role to play here in terms of uh, why insects attack one crop, one farm versus another farm. And we'll talk more about soil organic matter on Thursday. So when I see the data from Larry Phelan, it reminds me of the work that I had the opportunity to be involved in in Central America. Um, <clears throat> and this is just one of the studies uh, in Nicaragua that we uh, had going on with the, the, farming, the farming community uh, for about six years, which means they grew about, um, they grow three crops a year. So they grew about uh, uh, 18 crops in a system of tomato, bean and corn or maize. And there were two systems that we looked at. One was mineral fertilizer, synthetic insecticides. It's up on the top left. And then the other, and no cover crops. And on the bottom, the other plot had uh, mung bean cover crops with all the crops, including the beans, uh, which was tilled in the soil after it was about, you know, 18 inches tall. And uh, uh, neem insecticide, so this is a biological insecticide from the neem uh, tree, uh, which is actually growing in the background there, uh, and um, composted manure. Uh, they had about um, 10 beef, beef animals on this farm, and they uh, vermicomposted the manure. 
And in this particular year, uh, the volcano erupted um, in that region. This was probably about eight years ago, and it really stressed the crops. And in that year, and uh, you, this was not the an isolated incident, but you could really see that the conventional tomatoes looked awful. The organic tomatoes that did much better. And 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 it 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 kind of reminds me of this. Um, you know, it's sort of a pr proof that that uh, you know these organic systems uh, under stress can actually perform really really well. Okay, so with that as an introduction, let's carry on our discussion about insects in organic production. How do we how do we deal with them? Well, uh, we can prevent the problem or we can intervene once the problem has arisen. This is really uh, something you know, you're all quite familiar with. So one of the easy things that we can do is to think about variety selection. If we can select varieties, for example, in the case of wheat, we have saw fly resistant varieties, we have midge resistant varieties, and um, th these are good strategies uh, to, to use. Um, <clears throat> and these are non-GMO uh, interventions in terms of plant breeding. The midge tolerance was, was uh, uh, done by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and the first variety was released in 2007. Uh, um, Jetheria, one of the more recent varieties, released in 2015. And the way this works is that a small portion of the seed in the in the, in the seed lot is actually a midge susceptible variety. So in the case of Jetheria, there's a little bit of carberry in there. And the reason for that is so that we don't build up tolerance to the midge in the Jetheria. <clears throat> so so this is a good strategy, and it's one that many of you will be very very familiar with. The other strategy is crop rotation. And uh, crop rotation for insect, it works for some insects, it doesn't work for all insects, especially flying insects that can move around. Um, <clears throat> and this is probably one of the best organic flax crops that we ever grew. It's quite a few years ago. And what we did in our long-term study is we weren't looking at insect pests, we were actually trapping beneficial insects. And I just want to share a little bit of that information. So this is Shauna Humble. She was a graduate student, um, you know, over 20 years ago. I can't believe it. And we used these pitfall traps to, um, to trap the, the carabid beetles, which she then sorted out and uh, painstakingly identified. And in the study that we had, we had we had three organic systems, a grain only organic system, one that had green manures in the rotation, and one that had alfalfa mixed with grain crops. And this diagram here, the arrows actually point out different species of these ground beetles. And the green blobs are how the species sort of um, associated with different crop rotations. And the conclusion here is that different crop rotations resulted in different beetle populations. And what was interesting is that the greatest diversity of, uh, um, of plant population resulted in the most uh, diverse and the, the greatest number of beetles. And so that was that was a bit of a lesson early on uh, to say that you know diversity of plants means diversity of these beneficial insects. And so how can we design our farming systems to make these insects happy? And who cares? Well, this is one of the reasons that we care <laughs> is that these insects, these carabid beetles, they actually serve purposes in our farming system. They eat grasshopper eggs. They eat other pests, of insect pests. They also eat a lot of weed seeds. And at the bottom I've written here, why is this important? Um, 
Other studies have indicated that 50 to 80% of weed seeds in the soil may be consumed by insect seed predators. So these people are weed seed eating machines. That's why we, one of the reasons we want them. And what Shauna discovered in her masters was that different species were actually related to different weeds. And so we didn't have a cause and effect, but in the plots that we had more red root pigweed, we had more harpalus. In the plots that we had more wild mustard, we had more of these species. And you know, this kind of ecological knowledge is increasing. But the idea of using pitfall traps uh, to understand the insects on organic farms is a good idea. And I would advise agronomists to do trapping on farms. And by the way, you use recreational vehicle antifreeze so it doesn't kill any dogs who might take a drink out of the cup. Another rotation consideration is uh, wheat streak mosaic virus. So the picture on the upper left shows a virus affecting a wheat plant, and that virus is spread by the wheat curl mite. And many of you have, will have heard of the green bridge. And let me see if I can explain it. So if we have this wheat crop here, which is affected by the curl mite and has the virus, um, we want to not have a green bridge. We want to have a period where we don't have any wheat growing before we plant a new crop. So let's say, for example, we had a crop of, of, of spring wheat here and we want to plant a crop of winter wheat. We want uh, to avoid this green bridge because that's where the wheat curl mite survives. So that's another example of a crop rotation management thing to deal with pests. Okay, so um, let's go a little further and talk about new forms of diversity to prevent some of our insect problems. Now this, this data looks at intercropping, and it comes from my colleague Kristen McMillan at, uh, at the University of Manitoba, and she has been looking at aphids in peas. And so the diagram here shows uh, aphid numbers per plant um, on July, um, July 23rd and July 30th in Arburg, Manitoba in 2020, and she has the peas growing by themselves, the pea growing with canola, the pea growing with flax, and the pea growing with oats. And the results are pretty clear that there's a statistically significant reduction in aphids affecting peas when these crops are inter when peas are intercropped. So pea oats, not an uncommon organic mixture, has fewer aphids. So, so that's that's something that's been observed time and time and time again. So intercropping is one way to reduce our insect pest problems. Now we don't always notice uh, the benefit of intercropping for insects, but it's pretty consistent. Uh, and this is just one example. So that's good. Now, what are the mechanisms by which a, an intercrop can reduce the insect, uh, insect uh, in, in infection? Well, part of it's physical, and I'll get to that with an example in a minute. But the other thing that happens is that plants actually talk to each other with their volatiles. They actually release chemicals, and those chemicals float in the air, and other plants will respond to them, either the same plant in the same species or maybe another species talking to, you know, talking to each other. And, and because of this, so for example, this study that looks at plant volatiles uh, based insect pest management and organic farming, the population density of uh, arthropod herbivores in polyculture, that is in mixtures of crops like intercrops, is found to be lower than in monoculture. In contrast, the population den density of natural enemies, especially parasitoids, which we'll talk about in a minute, are found to be lower in monoculture. So the enemies of the pests are lower in monoculture. Um, 
and the uh, but the pest itself is higher in monoculture, and and that's that's one of the values of intercropping, and it may explain what Kristen found in her results. And this area of of plants talking to each other through the aerial environment. We're going to talk about the soil environment next time with mycorrhiza. Um, you know, this is actually real. Uh, people have studied this. Uh, there's good literature. So if even if this exact same plant is attacked by an insect, it's going to, or by a pathogen, uh, it's going to uh, send out these volatiles, which we call secondary plant metabolites. So they're not sugars and proteins. They're other things that are more metabolized in the plant. And a neighboring plant is going to sense those and turn on some of its uh, self-defense mechanisms. It doesn't absolutely make the plant immune to maybe that insect, but it certainly increases its resistance. And I have colleagues in my department, uh, Dr. Fuad Deif, who, who studies um, the way that plants talk to each other and the way that the soil talks to the plant to help it prepare for pathogens. And this uh, is um, improved in polyculture because you have a greater diversity of plants. Now, if you don't think that's it, most amazing, um, if you look up at the top right here, we've actually got these double helix DNA things. And uh, what we know is that the priming, when this plant is attacked, sends a signal to this plant, this plant genetically primes itself to get ready for that pathogen, that priming can last for five days. That's really quite amazing. And uh, so um, there's a lot we're learning and uh, about natural pest resistance. Okay, so that's intercropping um, with peas and oats. Um, let me give you another example of how intercrops can help reduce pest problems. Now, some of you may have heard of a push-pull system. And this is a picture of it here, which I've taken from the plant biology teaching tools. And this is maize, and it's interseeded with a legume called desmodium. And we're talking here about corn borers. And the desmodium repels the moth, which is looking for a place to lay its eggs. So it's pushing the moth away from this part of the field because the moths do not like desmodium. So that's the push part. The pull part is the napier grass, which is growing here. It attracts the moth because of its volatile chemicals. So that's the push-pull, right? The, the legume pushes the, the, the moth, the grass attracts, pulls the moth. Um, and I'll show you a picture of the field in a moment. Now there's also pretty good uh, research to show that the desmodium, the legume, produces allelo chemicals that interfere with striga parasitism. Striga is a parasitic weed, which is very damaging in soils that are very unhealthy in the tropics, like Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, <clears throat> the desmodium also produces allelopathic chemicals that inhibit the attachment of the striga weed to the maize roots and cause suicidal germination of the striga. So this sounds almost too good to be true. Um, so here is um, a better or a, a more in-depth description of what actually happened in the field with this push-pull system. <clears throat> so here we've got maize with its desmodium in this plot growing between the rows. We've got napier grass growing next to the rows in strips. And then the napier grass, uh, when the stem borer uh, feeds on there, there's this uh, sticky exudate which actually makes the, um, makes the moths, babies very unhappy. And so they are kind of stuck there and they don't do a lot of damage to the napier grass. And the result of all of this is that the maize yields 
Uh, compared to monocrop, which is in the white bars, the push-pull maize yield is in the dark bars. You can see uh, in this uh, publication that the scientists working on farmers' fields at about 12 or whatever different locations found that the push-pull system, 14 actually, uh, did much, much better. And th these are real, um, real effects. Of course, the question is, how do we do this in Canada? How do we do this in the US? How do we do this in large scale agriculture uh, in, in our context? And, and that's maybe a challenge for us to think about how to, how to do that. Here's just another example using sorghum this time and using a different grass species. And the point I wanna make here is to show you a field of the maize underseeded with the legume and then the grass attractant on the outside. So I think when I look at this, I already get some ideas about how we could maybe construct these kind of systems um, in our agriculture. And it, it might mean our fields look quite a bit different, but if that's what we need to do, maybe that's what we need to do. <clears throat> and by the way, the grass can be used for fodder. Um, it is not a waste. Um, and if there's any insect larvae in there, that just adds to the energy and the protein. So, so that's the push-pull system, which um, is a concept that we should always keep in mind and look for different species that either push or pull, depending on the insect that, that we're, we're dealing with. Um, we have, uh, if you look at the extension literature in Canada and the US and Europe and Australia, you do see people talking about trap crops. And this is a little bit the pull. So trap crops are plants that attract insects. For example, if we read the extension literature, um, what it tells us is that sawflies lay eggs in brome grass rather than wheat. So if we have a strip of brome grass, we can attract the sawfly out of the field, theoretically. We know that ligus bugs prefer cut alfalfa, at least that's what the extension bulletins tell us. So can we cut some strips of uh, alfalfa around an alfalfa seed field? Grasshoppers do not like certain pea varieties. So can we plant peas around, let's say our flax crops, which are more susceptible to, to uh, grasshoppers? And I've seen this done. And can we um, put a perennial strip around the field uh, and then till that perennial strips because we know the grasshoppers like to lay their eggs in those perennial planting strips and then we can till them and kill the eggs or kill the nymphs. So, so this is really uh, you know, our version of the pull part of the push-pull system. But I just wanted to share this with you. I've also seen a push-pull system in an organic dairy barn in Quebec. And what they did is they put essential oils on the animal and they put a sticky attractant on the wall. And so the flies would be repelled from the dairy animal and it would be attracted to the sticky wall and they get stuck there. So the push pull, so this was actually, I, I should, it wasn't in Quebec, it was actually uh, at the Alfred campus of the University of Guelph, which is in Eastern Ontario, right across the river from Quebec. That's where it was. And there's an organic dairy research unit there. And they uh, showed me their system. It's very interesting. Okay, another form of diversity. And now I want to talk about um, uh, something that maybe is... Uh, is easier to practice in large-scale agriculture, comes from Quebec. Uh, thanks again to Matthew for sharing this story. So this is a, about an 1,800-acre organic farm outside of Montreal, and what they have been doing is strip cropping their wheat, soybean, corn crops. And that coincided with a... Um, uh, and, and by the way, I'm going to talk a, a bit more about their, their ridge tillage system, which I mentioned, I believe, last class. But they, uh, uh, this coincided with some Quebec researchers who studied their system. And uh, what they were interested in is the aphids in the soybeans. So bear with me while I explain this diagram. Uh, so here we have the number of soybean aphids per plant. 
uh, from June 14th to mid-September. So this is this is the um, the cycle, and and the and the this, the aphid numbers went up when there was a lot of soybean to eat. And uh, this is from three uh, scenarios. The this uh, lower blue uh, diamond here is where there was only one single crop, a mono crop with no strip cropping. Uh, the red uh, box is where the strips were 36 meters wide, and the the triangle is where the um, or or uh, sorry, uh, the this is where it was a single crop. This is where it was, it was 36 meters, and the diamond here is where the the strips were 18 meters, so uh, quite narrow. And and what they found is that the you've already figured this out is that the soybean aphids were much more serious where there was just a monocrop of soybeans. And as they introduced these strips and went to narrower strips, the soybean uh, aphid outbreak was a lot lower. Why did that happen? Um, so the, the, uh, that's when we had the maximum outbreak and where we had strips. Uh, there was a lower outbreak than where we had a monoculture field. Well, if we look on the right-hand side here, this is where the scientists measured the natural enemies, the ladybugs that eat aphids. And what they found is that in the narrow strips, the um, which is the, the diamond here, the number of, of, uh, of ladybugs increased the fastest. It, uh, it was uh, maximized on... J uh, July 22nd, uh, one week before the uh, aphid numbers maximized. And so it was eating aphids, and that's the reason that aphid population came back down. When they went to the wider strip, 36 meters, uh, the, uh, they needed more ladybugs. They had more food for the ladybugs because there was more aphids. Um, but once the ladybug po population came up, the aphid population dropped. And where they had a monoculture field of soybean, it took a long time for the um, uh, ladybug population to increase to allow the aphid population to decrease. So why is that? Why did this happen? Well, the wheat acted as a refuge for the ladybugs, which uh, were then able to move to the soybeans and control the aphids. So because the wheat was growing very close to the soybean, those ladybugs didn't have a long way to move to go and eat the aphids. And that resulted in some impressive aphid control versus a large open field. It takes a lot longer. So strip intercropping here demonstrated uh, some insect control benefits. And, you know, are farmers prepared to go to 18 meter strips of different crops? Well, that's a question that you can ask yourself but it depends on what your pest challenge is. And there may be ways of making those strips um, more productive as well. So in Sweden, um, I visited a, an organic system where they were looking at, at fruit trees and then putting uh, pollinators close to them uh, so that the, uh, the refuge for the, the predator insect uh, was associated with an economic crop. And, you know, mostly what we look at is maybe you can cut this for hay, but uh, this could be of higher value. So it's something to think about. Okay, sticking with insects, let's talk about par parasitoids. These are insects that control other insects. And there's a long list of them. And um, as an agronomist, this is hardly my area of expertise, but I do teach this to my students. And so I am comfortable introducing you to the topic, but I would say that you should, you should continue to look for entomologists who can help you uh, understand this better. When we look at the major uh, crop pests, you know, even grasshoppers have parasitoids that kill them. Cutworms, Bertha armyworm, aphids, hessian fly, et cetera. Uh, wheat midge, um, <clears throat> diamondback moth. So there are parasitoids that can control many, many different insect pests. And if you want to look at a resource and learn about what these things look like, Dr. John Kowalski of Manitoba Agriculture has uh, a really great website 
uh, where he describes all of these things. And, um, you know, it's allowed me to understand these a lot better. How do we use them in agriculture? Well, this is an example from Quebec where um, the scientists are looking at releasing trichogramma, parasitic wasps, to con control the pests of, in this case, leeks. And so in this horticultural situation, they actually release these small packages um, and uh, so that the pest is there, the um, uh, parasitoid is there to attack the pest as soon as it emerges. So for example, if it's a cutworm, some of these parasitoids lay eggs in the cutworm and then the eggs grow inside the cutworm and kill it. So that's horticulture. Here's uh, um, uh, another part of the Quebec research, which is quite impressive. Quebec, of course, being the leading organic province in Canada with some of the best research. Um, here they're looking at evaluating flower strips as a natural habitat for the parasitoids. So if this interests you, I would suggest that you take a look at what Quebec is doing and maybe even uh, try to attend some of their field days. The, um, when, when you saw that little package, you might think, well, that's pretty impractical. Um, and yeah, putting packages down across a hundred acre field would be very difficult. But there is another organic farm in Quebec uh, agrofusion, that's the English pronunciation of it, um, that is many thousands of acres. And uh, when I visited them, they were um, hiring high school students to, to take these little packages of parasitoids and walk along the, the, the sweet corn rows and just throw them out every now and again. So they would equally distribute them across the field. And they were thinking of using drones and uh, sort of like a, a, an air nailer, you know, every you know, 30 meters drop one of these packages. So this has gone from, you know, small scale to even large scale. But of course, if we could provide habitat for the parasitoids so that we didn't have to deploy them in little cardboard packages, uh, that might be a lot better. Now, does, you know, how do we, if we, you know, think about how we organize a farm to keep things like parasitoids happy, what do we do? Um, you have a thousand acres, like how do you manage that to, you know, or is this all just academic gobbledygook? Well, if we look at the ecology research, the agroecology research, um, people have studied this and uh, this study here looked at how do landscape composition and configuration, organic farming and fallow strips affect the diversities of bees, wasps, and their parasitoids? And um, uh, the short answer is organic farming has an advantage when it comes to keeping diversity on the landscape. That's what they found. But here, this is right from their own text. Interestingly, habitat connectivity appeared to be enhanced by both higher edge densities, that means maybe more grass strips or shelter belts, and by organic field management. So if we are going to be deploying parasitoids and trying to keep them alive and keep them diverse, organic farming allowed us to do that. And why does it do that? Well, it may, it may just be the fact that there's a few weeds growing. They've got you know, different flowers to, to, to hover to, um, or it may be more deliberate where we put strips into the field. So do these things work? Um, so I want to end this sort of para this sort of section by covering the work of um, Z.R. Khan, uh, an older man now, not ancient, uh, and he. A lot of the papers that I've referred to come from him, and he does you know chemical ecology, insect behavior, habitat management. This is from Google Scholar, and what they did is they looked at studies from around the world where they looked at biological pesticides, um, augmentation, things like increasing the number of parasitoids, like releasing those little packages that I showed you, uh, intercropping, which we talked about, the push-pull system, maize and other crops, field margins, strips of land between crops and field boundaries sown to wildflowers and legumes, grass only or naturally regenerated, and then landscape effect. 
the effect of distance of cultivated areas to natural habitat. So they looked at these things in what they call a meta-analysis. And so, um, and the, the publication just came out this year. And so what it shows us uh, that if, if the dots are to the left of the zero, that means there's less. So I think this says insect pests. And so all of the treatments resulted in fewer insect problems uh, and um, less, crop, less insect damage often resulted in higher yields and sometimes re re resulted in more natural enemies. So the push-pull system in particular. And this is just telling me, the clock is telling me that I'm half done. So, so you know, I, I think we'd have to conclude that these things work in principle and it they should be something that we as agronomists and farmers think about when we're designing our farming system. Um, and they work on a lot of different species, beetles, aphids, moths, termites. And this is, this is just a little bit more of, of their work. And yeah, it comes back to the question then is how do we organize the farm to promote parasitoids? So, you know, if you're a, a farm group in North Dakota or Montana or Alberta, I would suggest, you know, Get a get a hold of Jonathan Lundgren and um, and see uh, if if he can come and even do a farm scan and because the 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 nature of of the farm landscape would be different in every region uh, or talk to your local entomologists they're all over Canada um, but it's very exciting so should we do something like this where we put these flowering strips in the middle of our organic crops and maybe make those uh, fields actually narrower strips. Uh, it's a radical change from the way we do large fields now. Now, there is one special insect pest, and that's grasshoppers. Uh, there are 85 species of grasshoppers in Manitoba, about 180 in Canada, and about four of them uh, are what we would consider pests. And I've got pictures of all four of them here, the clear wing, the packard, uh, the two stripe, and I can't see what the top of that says. Um, and thank you very much to Allison Squires from uh, South, Southern Saskatchewan, who sent me these photos and shared uh, some of their experiences, her and Cody's experiences with um, grasshoppers in the drought years that we've had. This is their lentil crop. Here's uh, pictures that Allison sent me of the grasshoppers eating the weed seeds right out of the, and here are the flax bowls that have been eaten. We observed in our pea oat grazing mix that the grasshoppers would eat the oats and leave the peas. This is something that the literature would also support. Pastures were also impacted, especially alfalfa. As the season went on and everything was drying up, the grasshoppers had much less green to eat and we found that they would even go for the Russian thistle still growing in the fields. And that's something that people have noticed a lot. All of our caragana trees in the yard were stripped bare. So grasshoppers, when they are a problem, are a big problem. And this is uh, here from um, Nebraska, but it shows their grasshopper cycle. And we know that grasshopper are a reminder that nature works in cycles. In hot, dry years, they can get ahead of their enemies. And that's why you get these spikes. And in parts of Southern Saskatchewan and, and Alberta, Montana, we're in that spike right now. Uh, in cool, wet years, natural predators and parasites will get the better of them. Our extensive cereal cropping feeds the population booms in grasshopper cycles. Dr. Brenda Frick, University of Saskatchewan. What can we do? Um, I am no expert, but because Allison uh, asked me, I spent uh, lots of time reading the literature <laughs> And there's a few things that we, we, we do know. Um, in terms of grazing system, surprisingly, the twice over grazing system results in, in this research resulted in fewer grasshopper outbreaks than the, uh, than the season long grazing. And the reason for that is that it reduced the quality of the habitat for the grasshopper. Um, the uh, grasshopper need to have their sort of temperature regulated. And if you have, uh, um, areas in the field um, 
uh, where you've got inconsistent uh, temperature regulation, you can make the grasshopper less happy. Let me let me see if I can explain that a bit better. This is uh, actually some um, the extension bulletins from Texas, and it it talks about um, the fact that grasshoppers, as many of you know, prefer undisturbed areas. That's why they lay their eggs in ditches and things like that. Um, and what do we do to 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 discourage grasshoppers while well, we disturb those areas. We, we till our soils in the fall and so they don't want to, uh, want to lay their eggs there. But of course, there's a trade-off there between soil health. Uh, in the conservation reserve program in Texas, they talked about shredding uh, the perennials. So you're not having to kill them, but maybe we should go and, and mow our ditches. And maybe people already do that uh, because the, the dead plant material is less attractive to, to uh, grasshoppers. And so, uh, anything that uh, increases the um, disturbance of the soil will reduce the grasshopper. So I've listed, um, I've done a what I would call a, a C plus job of talking about what are the control strategies. Um, create poor egg laying sites, shred your forage, uh, grazing management, the twice over grazing. You can go back and read that slide. An alternating availability of bare ground and canopy cover affects the optimal thermal regulation. So I was just thinking in my mind about what about having, you know, strips of tilled land versus strips of untilled land. Could that help? Landscape diversity is very important. Things like wetlands that allows the other 180 species of grasshoppers to th thrive. And when you have greater diversity, you're going to have fewer of the pests and habitat manipulation to slow the nymphal development. Uh, you, want, you do not want to have the grasshoppers become adults. They are food limited, and if the food can be limited when they're young, they're not gonna be as damaging. And there are some biological controls uh, available, um, but I did look at this website and they said they're not produced, there's no supply for this year. And I've read that on certain extension bulletins as well. So, you know, what the landscape ecologist would tell us is that, okay, uh, if things like wetland maintenance is going to allow a greater diversity of grasshoppers to exist in that area, you should keep those wetlands because that means that you're three or four, or maybe in some areas it's up to 10 species that are damaging to crops, are just not going to be in those high numbers. And like Brenda Frick said, when you have a monoculture cereal with very few natural areas, no wetlands, that is where the spikes in grasshoppers are the worst. So complex agricultural landscapes can help maintain biodiversity, which can contribute to control of pests. It doesn't eliminate them when, they're, when we have these serious droughts and we have these spikes. There is some data out of China looking at locusts and studies have shown that in areas where non-host trees have been planted, locust den densities have declined significantly. And, and what they have also talked about is that you should get rid of the grass, you should graze under the trees uh, so that you have the non-host trees, but you have um, an area that the grasshoppers don't wanna lay their eggs. That's the best I can do. But if we think back to our original farm, our organic farm here in the white lines and then this conventional farm, I can't help thinking that the organic farm would be a little bit more insect resilient than this farm. The challenge with grasshoppers is when they get into such high numbers, they move so quickly that some of these strategies, if you only have one organic farm every 100 farms, may not make that big a difference. Let me give you another example of, of uh, because I'm, I'm not quite willing to give up on making the field look different. <laughs> and that's really what the data is telling us, that you need more diversity in the field. You need intercropping. You need maybe some of these perennial strips. Well, this comes from New Mexico, and this is an irrigation pivot, as you can see. And there's corn growing here, but between the corn, there are perennial grass strips. Why do they have those grass strips there? 
Well, they have them there because they don't have enough water to irrigate the whole pivot anymore because the Ogallala aquifer is drying up. And so Dr. Sangu Angadi has been charged with trying to make these systems run on less water. So one of the options is just to irrigate half the pivot. The other option that they came up with is put these perennial grass strips and don't irrigate them and save the water for the grain crop. And um, he's tried really hard to get entomologists to work with him. And he, I, I asked him about grasshoppers. He said, we, didn't, we don't have that research. But they did look at how these perennial grass buffers uh, affect the insect uh, diversity. And the conclusion here is that species richness uh, the grass buffers had significantly higher species richness and evenness uh, of, of insects. And that's always the first sign that something good is happening in terms of stabilizing the insect population. Now, the other thing, of course, is that farmers aren't going to do this unless there's some other benefit. Like, what's it doing to my bottom line? What's it doing to yield? And that's where... Uh, Dr. Angetti, as a, as a crop physiologist and agronomist, has done some work. And so here on the bottom right, we look at the buffer strips and the seed yield. And there is your, your, um, your buffer strip there and there with the deep roots. And here's the corn yield. And on in the middle of the, of the buffer, the corn yields are actually higher. And um, over uh, the uh, width of the, um, of the corn rows, uh, the corn yield with the buffer is higher than with uh, no grass buffer. H how could that be? Well, one of the reasons is better water use efficiency. So in a very clever experiment, what they did is release these smoke bombs and looked at the movement of air across a monoculture of corn. So they released the, the smoke bomb there. You can see the air, the wind is moving right into the corn. When they released the smoke bomb here, the perennial grass was forcing the air up. And so it would reduce the evaporative demand for water on that corn crop. So this is one of the co-benefits of this type of a system. So, you know, we can chew on that for a while. Now, we can also treat the insects, and I talked about there are some biological um, biological uh, control. And, and I, I thought this was the most interesting machine I've ever seen. This farmer in Quebec was using uh, a spinosad uh, organically approved uh, insecticide and trust, but then uh, the Colorado potato beetles that he was dealing with uh, developed resistance to it. So he, he developed this machine that has a fan that blows the Colorado Colorado's off the potato plant and then these flamers that burn uh, the larvae. And you can see the cooked larvae down here. So I just had to share that because, um, you know, this is somebody who's actually intervening once the pest is there. And it's an example that's worth looking at. All right, let's, let's shift gears. We talked about uh, insects. I want to talk about diseases. And I think disease management is just a lot easier to deal with than insects. Uh, it's controlled through diversity, through having healthy soils, which we'll talk about next class, intercropping. There are biological processes. I'll show you a little data on compost tea. <clears throat> but the crop rotation is just so important. And um, I'd like to just share the sort of the crop rotation evolution uh, from Northern Europe over the last 500 years. And we used to have a two crop rotation, fallow crop, fallow crop. And then uh, uh, the Europeans in, in the Netherlands and in, uh, in England, France, Germany, they went to a three crop rotation. Uh, and that, that took a that took 100 years because uh, they had to change land tenure. So we think of a, putting a perennial strip in a corn crop is a big deal. Uh, what they did is much more uh, challenging. And then um, in, in the early 1800s, uh, the four-year crop rotation came into being. This is uh, what they often call the Norfolk four-year crop rotation. And this was a game changer because this is, <clears throat> uh, this is when animals were really integrated into the farming system. And that, uh, because up until then, a lot of the animals were just on the common lands. 
And so we're looking, for example, at a legume here uh, to feed the animals, uh, wheat, um, maybe another feed crop, or it could be potatoes, could be fodder beets and another, another seed crop. And so the animal manure would be cycled back in. This four-year crop rotation allowed the population of, of Europe to, to increase dramatically. So crop rotation had a huge effect. And then by the uh, late 1800s, uh, the seven-year crop rotation was very popular. And this is all in German here. This is my first language. But we're looking here at, again, uh, clover, uh, cereal, maybe a fodder beet, sugar beet, oats, then a pea uh, oat mixture, pea barley mixture, whatever, then potatoes, and then other grain crops. So that sort of cycle. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the cycle that was used on both of my parents who grew up in northeastern Germany uh, from the early 1700s until the, um, you know, the 1950s. And then along came fertilizer, people got rid of crop rotation. But, but this seven-year crop rotation, I always tell the students, this, this is a very good organic rotation. This is an ideal, this is one to think about, how can you possibly have a rotation like this? Now, another example, like, let me show you how crop rotation really matters. And I'm taking this from conventional agriculture, but what we're looking at here is a club root resistant canola variety, a susceptible variety and a moderately susceptible variety. This is in back-to-back -back canola. So yeah, the club root resistant variety will grow a bit. But look at what happens when we use a two-year rotation or a three-year or a four-year rotation. So that means we only include the club root resistant, the, the canola uh, one year and four. And look at how much better it grows. Yes, it has genetic resistance to the pathogen, to the fungus club root, but rotation really matters. And then here it is in a five-year rotation. I just wanted to show you this to illustrate the power of rotation when it comes to crop diseases. <clears throat> and so those Europeans before they had um, they had um, fertilizer, uh, they were forced into that rotation for their nutrients, but it brought along all these other benefits. Now, when it comes to plant diseases, uh, there's some very, very good work in, uh, in Europe uh, for organic farmers. And so the uh, Maria Fink uh, is uh, a person that I would definitely uh, alert you to, to read her work. Uh, she's uh, a rock star in the organic plant disease management world and has uh, alerted you to some of these publications, which are, which are open access, which you can um, access online quite easily. Of course, one of the things that always is stressed in disease management is intercropping. And here's a study from all kinds of intercrops around the world. And most of them yield more than when you grow the crop by itself. But of course, we're interested in the disease benefits of the intercrop. In, in southeastern Saskatchewan and in southwestern Manitoba, uh, those those farmers have been really lucky because they've been exposed to Scott Chalmers in Manitoba and Lana Shaw in Saskatchewan. They're only about, I don't know, 100 kilometers from each other, maybe a bit more. And they've both done a lot of research on all kinds of intercrops. And uh, they have a lot of interesting resources. I, I just want to show you one. I, I want to tell you a quick story. Um, so let's look at the bottom right. This is uh, wheat growing either by itself or with different intercrops. Now, treatment 10 and 11 are quite different in the percent leaf area of the wheat that's affected by disease. Treatment 11 is a full seeding rate of wheat. Treatment 10 is a half seeding rate of wheat. <laughs> what, does, what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is reduce your seeding rate and you'll have less disease. But remember last lecture, I talked about the virtues of high seeding rates. <clears throat> and over here, if we look at the weed biomass, the high seeding rate has way fewer weeds than the, than the half seeding rate. So for weed control, we wanna have high seeding rates for disease management. Uh, if we're in a disease year, 
uh, we want low seeding rates. So how do we deal with this? This is where intercrops can play a really important role because maybe not a soybean flax intercrop as depicted here, but when you have crops, let's say in the back here, you've got two rows of, let's say flax, and then maybe two rows of peas or chickpeas, you have the have high yield potential, but your disease load is going to be lower because diseases are not going to just be able to sweep across the whole field. They're going to get interrupted by a non-host crop. <clears throat> so for example, treatment five is wheat and field pea. You can see it has, uh, in one year, it has quite a bit less disease than, uh, than the full rate of, of, of wheat. And so that's really all I want to share about this data set is how do you trade off weed suppression with, with disease management and intercrops is one way to do this. <clears throat> now we've known about intercropping for a long time. Um, you get all kinds of interesting interactions, especially when you have a legume versus a non-legume. Uh, you can suppress weeds that's what the previous gra graph showed us. But intercrops also intersect with the soil. And intercrops allow interesting connections between below ground connections through the common mycorrhizal network that allow plants to share resources and allow plants to help each other fight diseases more on that next class. But when we think about which plants are the most mycorrhizal, you know, legumes, all the legumes other than lupins that we grow are highly mycorrhizal. Corn is, flax is, sunflower is, potato is. Uh, wheat, oats, and barley are mycorrhizal, but they're not as mycorrhizal as these crops. And so if we look at, for example, oat pea mixtures, you've got a highly mycorrhizal crop with only a moderately mycorrhizal crop, but that's a good combination. So it's good to know which plants are mycorrhizal, which plants are able to associate with these beneficial soil fungi. More on that next class. The other form of intercropping is this strip intercropping, which I talked about um, in uh, Quebec. Now, how many of you want a field looking like this? Put up your hands. Okay, I can't see your hands. But, um, you know, again, farmers would never do this unless there was real value. And there has been quite a bit of work on strip intercropping in places like Iowa um, for a whole bunch of reasons, soil conservation, uh, yield potential. But there hasn't been very much in organic production. And I think that for conventional farmers, strip intercropping may not really be all that practical. But in organic agriculture, there may be really good reasons to do it. And so I, I think we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, so, so what we know about strip intercropping is it's a, it's a very good way of dealing with insects and diseases and, and even provide some weed suppression. There's also a little bit of a yield boost because you're farming the edges. Uh, so wheat, soybean, uh, corn, uh, you've got, you know, the wheat is growing uh, before the soybeans use a lot of light. And so the, the, the yield at the edges can often be higher. And so it can increase your yield potential. So that's another benefit. Disease management with crop rotation. I talked about that. There are some special cases and one is with mustard. Mustard uh, you're probably all familiar with the use of mustard as a biopesticide, especially in the potato industry. And uh, I'll alert you to this uh, video. But um, uh, in a, a lot of places now in the world, people have caught on to this, even in Manitoba. This is a picture from Manitoba Potato Farm where you grow mustard that produces glucosinolates and it kills verticillium wilt in the soil. There are some very, very specific management practices. You, you have to flail mow the mustard and then you have to incorporate it within five, five minutes um, to get and then seal that soil to get the glucosinolate to bio to kill the fungus in the soil. 
Okay, it says 20 minutes after chopping. Okay, I was wrong. Um, so um, uh, th this is something that is exciting um, because um, brassicas could also allow us a way to control the diseases, for example, of peas, of aphenomyces. And so people are looking at how these brassica plants, and it has to be the right uh, type of mustard. It has to, I think oriental mustard works well, and there are some high glucosinolate mustards. So this data I showed you when I answered uh, somebody's question a couple of classes ago, and it looked at peas growing on soil that has a history of peas, and you can see um, the percent loss of pea biomass, you know, is very damaging because of the aphenomyces. But if we had peas growing after a brassica or even after oats or even after sweet corn or soybean, uh, there's a lot less disease. So brassica cover crops, uh, oat cover crops. We talked about brassica. There's a lot about brassicas in the literature. I want to talk a little bit about oats because oats are easier to establish. The seed is usually fairly affordable. And maybe there's things about oats that we don't know. So you remember I showed you this picture from Scott Beaton's seeding rig, and, and I talked about these little dead plants on the surface. And here we have uh, exactly the same scenario at our plots at Glen Lee, where we seeded oats last fall. And what we know from the literature is that there are a lot of fungostatic compounds that oat tissues will release. And those compounds kill diseases. Exactly what diseases and exactly how effectively and how much biomass you need, I cannot tell you. But I do know that farmers, fi we find it beneficial to have this little ratty cover crop going into the winter. It also conserves the soil. And then hopefully we can direct seed in that, especially with a pulse crop. And you know, it is a way of uh, managing diseases. I mean, the data shows that. So when it comes to disease management, that, that cover crop uh, idea has a lot of uh, merit. Now, the other thing we'll talk about next class is that we look at a disease, pulse diseases, the uh, mycorrhizal fungi, and there's just a picture of the spores, are really important for protecting the plant as well. Now, I'm gonna end with just uh, a, um, a couple of comments on compost tea. Um, th these are just pictures I took off the internet, um, but compost tea is uh, being, uh, there's a lot of questions about compost tea for uh, disease suppression. Well, first of all, what is it? Um, so people use terms uh, interchangeably, so, you know, we know what composting is and we know what compost is. And vermicomposting is where a process of worms digesting the organic matter to transform the material into a beneficial soil amendment. And then there's vermicompost tea. So this is basically where we take the, 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 plant, the, the, the filtered products of the vermicompost and ferment it in water for more than one hour. Then we have compost leachate, where liquid that has leached through a compost pile is collected and used. Compost slurry. And then compost tea additives, materials apart from compost and water that are added in the process of making compost tea, uh, which are presumed to sustain and enrich microbial growth. So there's many different things to think about with compost tea. There's vermicompost tea, there's compost leachate, there's compost tea, you can add things to them. There's a suppressive compost tea. A suppressive compost tea provides or changes the environment so the pathogen does not establish or persist, Est establishes but causes little or no damage. Okay. Um, the analogy there is um, that if you have a leaf of potato, and you spray some compost tea on it, it occupies that whole leaf with bacteria, let's say, or other, maybe some fungi. And so a, a late blight spore that lands on that potato has competition from the organisms that are in the compost tea. So you're not gonna kill the late blight, but you're gonna reduce its impact because it is 
uh, not the only pathogen on that leaf. Make sense? Okay. And that's probably the mechanism that is the one that you can take to the bank. Now, does it work? Um, I'm just going to show you uh, two quick data slides. These come from Bangladesh um, by Mohammed Islam. And actually, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Islam, both in Canada and in Bangladesh. He's a very good pathologist. And here, uh, we're looking at three treatments on potato and tomato. Treatment one is the control, no treatment. Treatment two is a chemical fungicide. Treatment three is a foliar compost tea. And we're looking at potato and the percent infected leaves per plant. And you can see the both the fungicide and the compost tea reduce the infection by the late blight significantly. And the percent of leaf area diseased ends up being pretty well half of the control. And so very, very effective on potato. On tomato, there was a significant reduction of the chemical pesticide, but the compost tea did not make any, was not significantly different from the control. And th this supports other research, even in Canada, where people have seen some late blight suppression with compost tea. And so, uh, you know, that is, uh, would I would I recommend compost tea on a wheat field uh, to suppress, you know, septoria complex diseases? I, I just don't know anybody who's done that, or I don't know any research to support that. Um, but on a high value crop like potato, I think it does make sense, and it did affect the yield in the case of of uh, uh, Mohammed's work here. We're looking at twelve tons per hectare for the control. 22 for the fungicide and 28 uh, for the compost tea. And here the compost tea yielded significantly higher than even the fungicide. So the conclusion that they came to is that compost tea as a foliar spread spray in case of potato uh, was uh, an alternative to a fungicide. Um, they, uh, also mentioned that it worked well as a soil drench in tomatoes, so a soil application, not a foliar application in tomatoes, so the application method may change. And they, they also caution, though, that the suitability of compost tea as a technology to control plant diseases needs to be evaluated against a wide range of pathogens and also different forms of compost tea, because manure may not always be the same. Okay, well, that brings me to the end of my time. Um, uh, we'll uh, like to thank you for your attention. Um, I look forward to your questions and discussion points, which we'll talk about Friday. And then Thursday, um, we will talk about soil health, uh, soil organic matter. Uh, don't miss it. It's going to be good. And, um, and also how that interacts with weed management systems. So I'll turn it back to Marla now and stop sharing my screen. I wish you all a great day. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. And I will just put up my... Perfect. So all that's left for today, uh, other than another big thank you uh, for your presentation, is to remind people of uh, the sponsors who have made this all possible. Uh, our platinum sponsors, Grain Millers and Saskweed, our silver sponsors, Nature's Path, the Bada Family Initiative, uh, Canadian Seed Security, PHS Organics, and our friends at FW Cobs. And we gratefully acknowledge uh, the funding from the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. And last but not least, if you are an agrologist or an agronomist, uh, you can get your CEA credits by pointing your phone at that QR code on your screen and it should automatically uh, register that you have uh, attended this course today. And in the emails that we've been circulating, there are other ways to get your CEU credits if you're not able to make this uh, QR code work. Um, so uh, don't worry, you'll get your codes. And that's it for us today. So have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you next time. <laughs>